Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. In order to get in as many members as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and responses. And at question number one, I call Ivan McKee. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment has made of the potential impact that any future devolution of powers relating to setting of the minimum wage to the Scottish Parliament would have on its fair work and wellbeing economy policies. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. In building a new Scotland, a stronger economy with independence, we propose a national minimum wage set at a rate that better reflects the cost of living and doing business in Scotland. Responsibility for setting future rate increases could fall to a Scottish low pay commission and could signal a new consensus building approach to minimum wage setting. While these key powers remain reserved to Westminster, we continue to pro promote our fair work agenda to deliver fairer working practices, including the payment of the real living wage, now set at £12 per hour for workers aged 18 and over outside of London. Ivan McKee. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Low pay, as we know, is a prime driver of poverty and control of setting the legally binding minimum wage is a key lever to tackling that. So um, can I ask the, the Cabinet Secretary what level the Scottish Government would set the Scottish minimum wage at where it to have the power to do so? Cabinet Secretary. I thank Ivan McKee for that question and agree with him uh, that uh, low pay is indeed uh, a key driver of poverty. We propose uh, establishing a fair minimum wage at a level that better reflects the cost of living uh, in Scotland, a single rate for all age groups, ending the current approach that discriminates against young workers. And we continue to call for employment powers to be devolved to enable us to create fairer workplaces, enhance workers' rights in Scotland and help shift the curve on poverty and deliver a fairer, greener and growing uh, economy and a more prosperous Scotland. In the meantime, we remain committed to put promoting the real living wage as part of our fair work agenda. Question number two, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what proportion of onshore wind farms approved in the past year had majority support from the local community, uh, and I refer members to my registered interest regarding two 12 kilowatt domestic turbines. Minister Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Ministers determine applications for consent under Section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989. The Scottish Government does not collect data on community support for applications determined under the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997. Decision makers do consider all relevant material available to them before making any decision on an application, including the application documentation, consultation responses, representations and other material information. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Minister, for answer. Now, last year, Garbett Wind Farm, that borders my constituency, received consent from the Scottish Government, despite an overwhelming objection from a local community in Murray Council. Similarly, Mealbury was approved by the Scottish Government this summer, despite over 200 objections from residents and the Highland Council. There are now fears that the proposed Annect Estates Hill Affair Wind Farm in my own constituency is a foregone conclusion despite just one in ten residents being supportive of the plans. So will the Minister back my calls for communities to be given a statutory voice over wind farm applications exceeding 50 megawatts? Minister. So uh, it's interesting that, that Mr Burnett's original question that asks for like, majority support. That would suggest that he is calling for some kind of vote or recording of uh, intention or, or support from every uh, single person of, of some kind of voting age. I am not sure that you can actually ascertain from a consultation whether it's majority or minority support, because that's not the way that planning uh, applications are done. But what I would say to Mr Burnett is that uh, we have an onshore wind sector deal, and that onshore wind sector deal committed, we committed the, um, the, the government in terms of what the industry were asking of us, in terms of streamlining processes. But what we were asking of, of the industry and the sector was that they wanted, we wanted them to be engaging with communities at the earliest opportunity possible in project development cycle to agree a community package that will meet or exceed the principles set out in the good practice principles for community benefits, but also engaging with communities on their plans as early as possible to actually engage with them and see what would, would work where and where, where the best uh, compromises could be made where they could be. Thank you. Colin Beattie. 
The onshore wind sector deal signed last month at the Scottish Renewables Onshore Wind Conference was very welcome. How will this deal ensure that local communities benefit fully and share in the rewards of onshore wind developments? Minister. I uh, thank Colin Beattie for that. I'd already alluded to, to that, that deal in my, in my answer to Mr Burnett, so I, I want to thank him for his warm words about that. It's a significant milestone in ensuring that communities are fully engaged in and benefit from our green energy transition. The industry is committed to engaging with communities from the earliest opportunity possible in that project development cycle, as well as agreeing to that uh, community benefits package that is, is, is exceeding the principles set out in the good practice principles. I mean, I have tasked them with making more meaningful offers in terms of what that might mean for communities. I have often uh, made the point that for a lot of the rural communities that are the sites for onshore wind, they're also suffering from a great deal of fuel poverty as well. So maybe something more constructive can be done in that. Industry is also committed to promoting supply chain opportunities to support increased local content and projects, as well as committing to an appropriate number of apprenticeships, training opportunities, skilled jobs across the sector and related industries for the lifetime of the sector deal. And these commitments demonstrate the importance that both the Scottish Government and the industry continue to place on good community engagement and delivering, delivering meaningful benefit. Question number three, Daniel Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of whether Scotland's infrastructure is equipped to deliver the current offshore wind pipeline of up to 42 gigawatts, including in relation to port infrastructure. Minister. I thank Dana Johnson for that question. Scotland's uh, natural resources, high wind speeds, skilled workforce, excellent port structure and strong innovation hubs make Scotland one of the best places in the world to develop on, uh, offshore wind and its supply chain. Uh, my recent trade visit to the port of Esberg in Denmark was an excellent working example of maximising port infrastructure and our strategic investment model alongside the recently announced £500 million of Scottish Government investment. I took a trade mission of people representing ports and including Forth Ports, Port of Leith, uh, Aberdeen Ports, along with me, so that they could learn from Esberg. Um, to fully maximise the benefits, though, we must continue to call on the UK Government to in deliver an enhanced transmission grid infrastructure at place, which would make all the difference. Daniel Johnson. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Can I begin by saying I think it's important we build consensus for the infrastructure investment we need to realise our renewables potential. But I would just wonder if the Minister read the article in the Financial Times recently, which quoted the Chief Executive Haventis, who are currently redeveloping the Ardressa uh, port, who said that with current port capacity, it would take at least 50 years to achieve the 42 gigawatts that's already licensed for Scottish waters. And this is in line with the floating offshore wind task score, which has said that we need £4 billion of investment. So can I ask the, the, the Minister what steps the Government is taking to ensure that, both, that, that there is sufficient public and private investment to, to ensure that we have the port infrastructure to realise our offshore renewable potential? Minister. Uh, Daniel Johnson makes really good points. I hadn't read that particular article, but I'm familiar with the, the arguments contained within it. There's a couple of things that we're doing. I mean, I think the 500 million investment is really uh, directed around this kind of infrastructure and port infrastructure because it is so apparent that we need to beef up our ports infrastructure to deliver on our ambition. We've also got the strategic investment model working in collaboration, public and private sectors, to uh, develop what's called the SIM model to move from project led to sector led investment investment that better supports uh, growth in port and supply chain capacity and capability. It's not just going to be government money can't just deliver on its own. It has to be public-private investment. That's why we had, uh, the First Minister announced that additional £500 million investment. We're, so we're currently working on exactly wh wh what that money could be used for, but we're doing that with the industry, with the ports, but with the, the, the offshore wind industry as well to see where that can best, best be deployed for the reasons that Daniel Johnson outlined. Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. The absence of offshore wind in the recent contracts for difference auction was extremely disappointing and signals that the United Kingdom government has failed to recognise the current market challenges that the sector faces. With this in mind, can the Minister provide an update on Scottish government investment that will help deliver the full economic potential of offshore renewables projects? Minister. 
Uh, thank Karen Adam for that. The, the, the results of AR5 sent a, a shockwave through the, the industry. Uh, and I, I actually was on that, that visit to Esberg when that came through with quite a lot of the uh, well, Scottish renewables were with me and a lot of partners on that. And, and uh, the fact that nobody bid for those licences because the strike price was too low uh, was of, of great concern. But of course, the UK government have heard, I, I hope, uh, the reaction to that, both from the, the sector and, and the Scottish government, and will hopefully improve things for AR6. But we have recently announced 500 million of Scottish government investment into that supply chain help us deliver for Scotland. It will stimulate and support private investment, as I mentioned to Daniel Johnson, in infrastructure and manufacturing facilities, critical to the growth of world-leading offshore wind sector. Uh, but the UK government must now address calls, as I said, from industry for the next round for contract for difference allocations to deliver on these projects at scale, not just for Scotland, but for the whole of the UK, but also, crucially, for grid infrastructure to unlock the enormous potential Scotland's Briefly, uh, Minister, renewable please. energy transition holds. Yep. Willie Rennie. Um, we do need to build confidence that the supply network is going to grow because one Scotland project warned recently of significant unanticipated changes in the Scottish and UK offshore wind industries and challenges regarding the availability and capacity of Scottish UK and European supply chains. So what early results can the Minister secure in developing that supply chain so we can build the confidence so we can maximise the potential for Scotland? Minister. Uh, th I thank Willie Rennie for, for highlighting the supply chain because that, the strategic investment model that I mentioned, the SIM, is actually critical to that. It's actually, it was launched, um, uh, the applications were closed in June, attracted a high level of interest. There were 44 applications. They were received with a total estimated capital expenditure of over £4 billion in total. And 41% uh, 40, of them actually are port infrastructure projects and the remainder are for other types of supply chain investment. That SIM model is moving really, really fast. That's something that the industry asked us for, and we are delivering it on, and it, is, it looks like it's working for the reasons uh, that, that Willie Rennie out, outlines. Um, we, we have to uh, have that, that collaboration with the industry and move on supply chain benefits as much as possible. Thank you. Question number four, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to boost hydrogen production in Scotland. Minister. Uh, thank Kevin Stewart for that question. The Hydrogen Action Plan confirms that the Scottish Government will support the hydrogen sector through a programme of capital funding to increase Scotland's production capabilities. Earlier this year, we launched the Hydrogen Innovation Scheme and offered uh, over £7 million in grants to projects that would accelerate innovation in hydrogen production. And last month, we announced £200,000 of funding for the North Sea Alliance Research Project, which will investigate pipeline infrastructure between Scotland and Germany and matching Scottish hydrogen production to German hydrogen demand. And the Green Hydrogen Fund, launching later this year, will further boost hydrogen production in Scotland. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I welcome the Minister's recent announcement in Aberdeen of funding for that hydrogen pipeline research, uh, which is really important. Uh, but can the Minister tell me what the government's intentions are in terms of reviewing regulatory and planning guidance to aid hydrogen production in Scotland? Minister. Uh, Kevin Stewart um, raises an important point and why it's critical that ministers work together on this. I'm ab absolutely um, uh, mindful of the fact that I need to work with my ministerial colleagues in planning to look at what can be done to accelerate uh, ways. So we actually keep ahead of innovation in this space. Innovation in renewable energy, but particularly in hydrogen, is happening really, really fast. And I should say that Aberdeen City is leading the way in this for their collaboration between Aberdeen City Council and BP. They've got plans to, to, to set up a, yet another uh, hub, a hydrogen hub underway. So it's important that we sort of like look at the learning that's happening in Aberdeen and, and make sure that other uh, uh, places around Scotland can learn from that. But I, I, give, I give Mr Stewart my, 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 uh, um, my word that I will speak to my planning colleagues about the issues that he's raised and happy to have further conversations with him about that. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's good to hear the Minister confirm that the Green Hydrogen Fund will launch this year. So can the Minister confirm how quickly the Scottish Government intends to allocate the £90 million it has committed so we can see the investment needed to boost green hydrogen production um, and also to help critically to decarbonise transport and industry? 
Minister. Yes, um, I, I'll give us some information. I mean, in, in addition uh, to the 90 million um, for renewable hydrogen uh, projects through the Green Hydrogen Fund, we're, we're expected to be investing, um, uh, we're invested 15 million already in the early stages, for example, of the I Aberdeen Hydrogen Hub, as, as I mentioned, and we're working with other regions who have similar ambitions to coordinate local hydrogen projects and production activity. So these things are happening even before the deployment of, of the 90 million. But um, things are happening at pace. Um, the Innovation Fund as well is that we're looking at all the projects that have, have, have made applications into that fund as well. We will look at the projects that we think will, be, will accelerate um, the hydrogen production that, we, that Sarah Boyack has mentioned, and I'll keep her up to date on that as much as possible. Question number five, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will outline details of its 80 million of financial support for the Scottish Cluster Carbon Capture Project, which it announced in January 2022. Minister. Thank you. As Mr Lumsden, uh, will be, uh, Lumsden will be aware, the UK Government has not still, uh, provided a timeline yet for the Scottish Cluster's deployment and they have not provided a concrete timeline for the deployment of the ACOM project at St Fergus. So, in the absence of this vital information, it is not possible at present to establish how the Scottish Government can best tailor our support for the Scottish Cluster, but the £80 million that we promised to the Scottish Cluster will be deployed in collaboration with the cluster as the project develops. Um, I think it's important to say that we will take the lead from them on how that 80 million will be deployed. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, the UK Government has selected the ACORN project at St Fergus near Peterhead for funding as part of the £20 billion carbon capture and storage investment package. ACORN is expected to support around 21,000 jobs at its peak. Scottish Government promised £80 million to go towards this vital project, but then snatched the money away. So when will this, this money now be reallocated, or is this another broken promise to the north-east of Scotland? Minister. I am so glad I have got the opportunity to finally actually rebut Mr Lumsden on this. I have heard Mr Lumsden attempt to deploy a complete misrepresentation yeah, of the £80 million pounds funding. That £80 million pounds funding is still there. It is available. It will be deployed in a manner which suits the multiple partners in the Scottish Cluster. Um, frankly, Mr Lumsden needs to stop this misrepresentation. Yeah, yeah. CCUS is a good news story. It is a good news story for both the Scottish and the UK governments and could show could show Mr. That Lumsden. We, what can be done when we both work together and take the politics out of this. The £80 million is there. It will be deployed in the way in which the Scottish Cluster want it. Yeah. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The UK Government's recognition of the enormous potential of the ACORN project and the Scottish Cluster was long overdue. It is concerning, however, that the UK Government has only committed to set out details for the next critical steps in this process in due course. Can the Minister provide an update on any recent engagement with the UK Government that seeks to avoid any further delay? And will she join me in urging the UK Government to work at pace with the ACORN project? Minister. Uh, thank Kevin Stewart for, for that question. The Scottish Government are in regular contact with the UK Government and our officials regularly engage with Desnes counterparts. In September, Mr Gray wrote to the UK Government urging them exactly what Kevin Stewart was saying, to avoid further delays and to work at pace to secure the fastest possible deployment for ACORN and the Scottish Cluster. And I join the member in urging the UK Government to show that ambition yeah. and publish that concrete timeline for the delivery of ACORN that the sector is looking for. A ACORN is vital for a just transition that supports the decarbonisation ambition for the range of Scotland's key strategic and economically significant industries. And I was at Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce at a round table yesterday with uh, people from uh, the region on energy, and they were making exactly the same points that they need clarity and they need a, an expedited timeline on this as soon as possible. Question number six, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I uh, apologise for my late arrival in the Chamber? To ask the Scottish Government when it anticipates that the sectoral marine plan for offshore wind for innovation and targeted oil and gas decarbonisation will be formally adopted. 
Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Our aim is to adopt uh, the plan in 2024. We are aware of the developers' uh, interest in the sectoral marine plan and the impact on delivery of projects, and we are working hard to streamline the process to address their needs. Audrey Nicholl. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. I recently met with stakeholders of the Salamander offshore wind project and in further correspondence I was informed that they have concerns with resource funding for statutory bodies involved in the consenting process. As an example, I was informed that Nature Scott has concerns with its levels of core grant funding and that this was highlighted by their director, Nick Halfhide, at a recent Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee meeting. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what engagement the Scottish Government is having with statutory bodies such as Nature Scott to ensure that they have the support required to continue their work in this important process. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank Audrey Nicholl uh, for her work in this area uh, of crucial importance. That, uh, our government officials are aware of the resource uh, challenges faced by uh, Nature Scott, and we are liaising uh, with them to ensure the required support is in place for the timely planning, licensing, and consenting of offshore energy projects and related uh, infrastructure. I'd be more than happy to write to Audrey Nicholl with further detail on that. Thank you. William Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The newly approved Rosebank field will emit around 12 kilograms of carbon dioxide per barrel of oil produced. But if electrified pursuant to INTOG or an equivalent scheme, that would fall to 3 kilograms. Given that imported LNG emits on average around 79 kilograms uh, of carbon dioxide per barrel, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that swift approval and deployment of INTOG will help make the already strong environmental case for ongoing production from the North Sea incontrovertible. Cabinet Secretary. We obviously want to see the decarbonisation of the uh, North Sea production, which is why we are supporting the INTOG uh, process. Uh, however, Mr Kerr will be aware that uh, the import of uh, oil products in particular will need to continue uh, as we cannot fully utilise all that is produced in the North Sea in our domestic production. Uh, however, our decarbonisation of oil and gas will continue through INTOG. Question number seven, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is addressing any labour shortages or skill gaps affecting the economy as a result of Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Labour and skill shortages are complex and for some sectors are the result of a combination of factors, including the UK Government's uh, immigration policies, Brexit, the pandemic and systemic issues within the sector. The National Strategy for Economic uh, Transformation Skilled Workforce Programme sets out actions we are taking to work with employers to address labour and skills gaps, including better alignment uh, and aligning the education skills system with the needs of employers, promoting uh, lifelong learning and expanding our available talent pool. Uh, we are also in the process of bringing forward a talent attraction migration service, which we hope will also assist. Rona Mackay. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the Scottish Government is working with the UK Government and other devolved governments to ensure that the immigration system is flexible and responsive to the needs of Scotland's economy and society? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank uh, Rona Mackay for that question. All uh, sectors of the Scottish economy are experiencing labour shortages as a direct consequence of Brexit and the ending of freedom movement. Uh, Scottish ministers have written to the UK Government on several occasions to outline their concerns and of employers uh, across Scotland. The UK Government's immigration system is not designed to meet our needs. It is having a damaging effect on Scotland's economy and communities. We have proposed amendments and improvements, such as a rural visa pilot. However, these have not been taken up as yet. So we are working productively with businesses and acting in those areas within our responsibilities, including promoter, promoting uh, fair work practices and the provision of upskilling uh, and retraining opportunities aimed at the hardest hit sectors. But it goes without saying that having a damaging migration service is not helping. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't understand this obsession on the SNP benches with Brexit. Legal migration into the United Kingdom has doubled since Brexit and is today at record levels. The real question is why is it Scotland doesn't attract our population share 
of these migrants compared to other parts of the United Kingdom. Why does the Cabinet Secretary think Scotland is so unattractive a place for migrants to come to? And what is he doing to try and turn that around? Cabinet Secretary. I thank Murdo Fraser uh, for coming back to a question that he's posed to me uh, previously. For every year since 2001 and 2002, inward migration from the rest of the UK uh, to Scotland has been greater than outward migration from Scotland to the rest of the UK. And if he thinks Members. If he, thinks, if he thinks it just happens to be the Scottish Government that has an obsession with Brexit and its impact uh, on uh, our economy, he just needs to talk to our stakeholders in the business community who will tell Murdo Fraser very clearly the impact that is happening on their trading environment, their access to labour and the impact on the Scottish economy. Question number eight, Paul O'Kane. To ask the Scottish Government regarding its long-term labour market strategy, what steps it is taking to address any skill shortages affecting the economy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as I have uh, just set out in my response to uh, Ms Mackay's previous question, we are taking a range of actions to address labour market uh, and skills shortages, including better aligning the education and skills system with the needs of employers and the economy, as outlined in NSET. Through the publication of the initial priorities and purpose and principles, the Scottish Government has committed to taking responsibility for skills planning at the national level that works with partners to set clear priorities against future skills needs supported by a regional approach. Paul O'Kane. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. And just on that regional approach, the skills shortage highlighted by the Weathers Report and others is particularly acute in my region. Regional employment has only grown by 0.6 per cent over the last decade, compared to a nationwide average of 4 per cent. And productivity is well below the national average as well, according to figures from SDS. Indeed, we have had proper challenges in West Scotland with large employers leaving uh, the region. Indeed, just in the last few weeks, we have heard uncertainty over jobs at Rolls-Royce and Renfrewshire. So, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can say what is he doing across government to try and tackle these shortages in the skill base to ensure that we retain businesses who need skills so badly? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think, I think it's both. Uh, and I, I thank Paul O'Kane uh, for that question. I very much recognise um, the situation that he has set out. And I've been working with some of the employers in the West of Scotland that have been looking at either uh, reducing their workforce or indeed moving out to try to uh, support those businesses to remain as he would expect. Uh, and obviously on the skills front, we're going to be uh, coming forward with our response to the Withers Review. Um, also in terms of the work that we're doing with the Green Industrial Strategy, making sure that we have a skills system that is aligned to uh, the green energy revolution that is coming um, is going to be critically important. I'm more than happy to collaborate with Paul O'Kane uh, in the areas that he has an interest in to ensure that we're getting this right. We now move on to the next portfolio, which is finance and parliamentary business. And at question number one, I call Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to allocate more funding to local authorities in its 24-25 budget to enable them to maintain and invest in local services, including sport and leisure facilities. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Decisions on future local government budget allocations are subject to negotiations with COSLA and the results will be confirmed as part of the Scottish Budget on the 19th of December. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response. He will be aware that just a few weeks back, uh, my constituents in Coatbridge and Chryson, along with people across North Lanarkshire, were met with the devastating news that the Labour-run North Lanarkshire Council had decided to close 39 leisure centres swimming pools, community hubs and town halls, many of which are integral to our communities. Thanks to hard-fought campaigning by individuals, groups and politicians across the area, the Council eventually U-turned on this decision. So I can ask the Minister, how can the Scottish Government support local authorities and impressing them the incredible importance of these community facilities to ensure that councils in the future aren't making such flippant and politically driven decisions? Minister. Thank you. Um, the Scottish Government places great importance on sport and leisure facilities. They are vital in supporting the physical and mental health of the nation. Sport Scotland, our national agency for sport, are working with local and national partners to help them assess the um, impact of any potential facility closures. And these discussions will continue over the coming weeks and months. Mr McGregor highlighted the local campaigns which encourage North Lanarkshire Council to change its decision. And while it is for democratically elected councils to make decisions on the priorities for their local areas, it is always good to see communities being able to influence those decisions. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, considering the widening deficit in local authorities' funding, can the Scottish Government confirm what efforts are being made to raise funds for local services? Minister. 
So the, the member will be aware that there is a joint approach with COSLA looking at uh, various means for raising money for the, the local government, headed up by my colleague Tom Arthur, but in collaboration with, with COSLA. And the, there's a number of streams of work there. One um, re recent stream of work coming forward is the uh, proposal to allow local authorities to raise 100 per cent additional council tax from, from second homes. Okay. Katie Clark. The First Minister's announcement of a council tax freeze without consulting councils will have a detrimental effect on local services if not fully funded. Last week, Western Bartonshire Council warned that it faces a funding gap of £17.3 million next year. Will the Scottish Government provide a fair funding settlement for all councils, including Western Bartonshire, so that local services like sport, and leisure facilities are protected. The, the, the council tax freeze um, will be fully funded, um, and it is, I, I think, really important that at this time of pressure on family budgets and, and burdens, that we are able to remove that, that uncertainty. And it's uh, really pleasing that it took two weeks, but that the Labour Party now appears to be supporting the council tax freeze. I don't currently know what the position of um, the Conservative Party on the council tax freeze, but I, I think it is really important that at this time, when family household budgets are so pressed, that we're doing everything within our powers to support them, and um, that's, what, that's what we're doing, and I'm pleased to see we have Labour support. Question number two, Michelle Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government how it monitors the overall effectiveness of financial memorandums. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robb. In preparing financial memoranda, the Scottish Government always learns from and applies any comments or recommendations that the Finance and Public Administration Committee have made on previous memoranda. In order to ensure that memoranda are effective in informing Parliament of the financial impact of proposed legislation, they are subject to a high level of scrutiny and review. Scrutiny is carried out by finance officials, the Parliament's legislation team, and finally, of course, by the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Michelle Thompson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Now, significant changes in projected spend, such as the 50 per cent uplift for the Children's Care and Victims Bill, indicate too little upfront detailed policy analysis. The large ranges and estimates also indicate considerable uncertainty. Speaking as a member of the FPA committee, I'm concerned that the general quality of FM is being presented to us. In an extremely tight fiscal environment, this suggests the need for more rather than less upfront planning. Is it time to look again at the guidance being offered to ministers? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, look, I, I think uh, Michelle Thompson makes some fair comment. Uh, we are committed, as I said, to maintaining the effectiveness of financial memoranda and ensuring that they remain fit for purpose. I'd be happy to engage with the committee on their concerns and to consider how guidance could be improved uh, in the spirit of consensus, President Officer. Thank you. Liz Smith. Uh, Michelle Thompson is absolutely right, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And uh, with the government making increasing use of the co-design principle, which is important in terms of the government relationship with stakeholders. One of the key issues is that if we get the financial memorandum ahead of the final process of that uh, co-design being completed, we're in serious difficulty on the Finance Committee because we can't scrutinise it properly. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what might be able to do about that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, in the spirit of uh, consensus, I, I think Liz Smith also makes some uh, valid uh, points. And as I said to Michelle Thompson, I'm very happy to engage uh, with the committee uh, on the issues that may be limiting their scope for scrutiny. Liz Smith has just uh, outlined uh, one aspect uh, to try and improve matters. So I would suggest that we uh, uh, look at how we can take that forward uh, again in the spirit of consensus and cooperation. Question number three is not lodged. Question number four, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what, est what it estimates the financial cost will be of its recently announced council tax freeze policy. Cabinet Secretary. We have committed to working with COSLA on the detail of the implementation of the council tax freeze over the coming weeks. The quantum will be discussed and agreed in partnership with local government, and this will form part of the broader funding decisions which will be made in the context of the Scottish budget for 
2025. Mark Griffin. Yep. For this policy to be credible, the government have to set out how much they have set aside to, to cover it. And while households will welcome any freeze in a bill right now, they will not to know that it is fully funded. Can the government give a guarantee that this freeze will not lead to any redundancies, reduction in services or increases in other council charges? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as my colleague Joe Fitzpatrick uh, said earlier on, we have made a commitment to fully fund the council tax freeze. That will be done by negotiation because there's obviously various ways that the final quantum could be calculated and there may be various opinions about that within local government. So it's important that we do that uh, in partnership with local government to reach uh, a common uh, um, agreement over the quantum. Uh, what I would say uh, to uh, the member to Mark Griffin is that um, it's taken two weeks for his leader to come to a conclusion about whether or not uh, he and the Labour Party supports the principle of the council tax freeze. Uh, now that they do, uh, I'm assuming that they will support uh, the council tax freeze as part of the budget setting process and we will very much look forward to working with them on that. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Labour has spent a fortnight protesting that this government will introduce a council tax freeze. Yet the Saturday before the Rutherglen and Hamilton West by-election, Labour distributed a leaflet which said, and I quote, vote to stop the SNP making you pay more council tax. No mention of a freeze or it being fully funded. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Labour's contortions on this issue betray the blatant cynicism of a party that will say anything for perceived political advantage? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. On the substantive yep. relative uh, point. Well, I, I would suggest what K K Kenny Gibson said is absolutely right. Labour have been all over the place uh, on this issue. But as I said, in the spirit of consensus, it's now good to see that they're supporting the, the freeze. Uh, I very much look forward to the budget to see if they actually vote for it to help those hard-pressed households. And if they change their mind again, uh, I think the public will be the judge of how Labour uh, vote uh, on that the freeze will provide much needed financial relief, particularly to vulnerable households. And with household spills uh, rising, the freeze will give some certainty to households for next year. And we look forward to seeing how other parties vote in this chamber. Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, councils are responsible, responsible for the delivery of community assets such as swimming pools and other sports facilities, youth clubs, art and drama classes. Does the Cabinet Secretary not recognise that by starving councils of funds is a false economy and by taking these funds uh, out of one page of the ledger means they will appear in other pages such as health, welfare, justice and education and with some interest? Cabinet Secretary. Well, from that uh, question, the tone of it, I would suggest Brian Whittle is saying that the Conservatives will not support a council tax freeze as part of the budget. That is a very interesting position uh, for the, the Tories to take. On the issue of resources to local government, we have increased uh, resources by over uh, £793 million, uh, pounds, which represents uh, an increase of 3 per cent in real terms. Uh, that is an increase, of course, beyond the flat cash position that was set out in the 2022 Resource Spending Review. When I look at the position of local authorities in England, where his party is in charge, with some of them going into administration and going broke, I really don't think any Conservative uh, member of this Parliament is in any position to come and lecture the Scottish Government about the support for local government finance. So we'll get on with supporting local government. We'll get on with discussing local government, with the local government, the quantum of support as we take forward the budget for this year. We'll just leave the Tories to snipe on the sidelines as normal. Before we move to question five, I'd be grateful if we could just avoid the running commentary because it does make it difficult for all members to hear. Question number five, I call Bob Doris. Thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its proposed electoral reform bill will seek to improve voter participation within the electoral process. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank Bob Doris for his question. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring everyone eligible to vote can do so. We will seek to improve the electoral process in the Reform Bill later in this session. Proposals are likely to include ways to increase registration amongst underrepresented groups, making voting more accessible for those facing barriers such as people with sight loss. And as always, President Officer, I remain open to the suggestion from others with regards to improvements. Bob Doris. 
I thank the Minister for that answer. President officer, votes must not only be cast, they must also count. And I have met with the Minister over my concerns that at the 2022 Council elections, Canal Ward in my constituency had the highest rate of spoiled papers in Scotland, three times the national average as a result of voter error. The Minister was receptive, the minister was receptive to my suggestion of placing a statutory duty on the Electoral Commission to having an ongoing duty working with communities to take steps to reduce the number of votes inadvertently spoiled. Can the Minister update me on Scottish Government work in this area and whether the Elections Bill can help deliver the same? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Mr Doris is correct. We had that meeting and we discussed things further. And at the 20, 20, uh, 2022 local elections, 1.85 per cent of ballots were rejected. While the overall number of spoiled ballots at those elections were down slightly, I recognise examples like the ones Mr Doris cites from the Canal Ward, where the numbers remain too high. I agree that most of, uh, more, more must be done to ensure that no one loses their votes. And I am interested in any proposals that can help achieve this. I am fully committed to working with Mr Doris on this issue as the Electoral Form Bill progresses and his specific suggestion on a more formal role for the Electoral Commission will be giving full consideration. Question number six, Maurice Golden. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what discussions the Minister for Public Finance, Planning and Community Wealth has had with ministerial colleagues regarding efforts to ensure that circular economy practices are embedded in public procurement. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Uh, Tom Arthur, the Minister for Community Wealth and Public Finance, is on an international engagement in the United States, um, which includes him speaking at a plenary session at the Obama Foundation Leaders event in Chicago. He'll hear firsthand their experiences in best practice from community wealth building initiatives in the United States of America. The Minister regularly has discussions with ministerial colleagues on a range of matters, including circular economy and procurement. The Scottish Government is committed to using public procurement to contribute towards the strategy priority of transition to a more resource efficient, lower carbon economy. Maurice Golden. I wish the Minister well on his low carbon trip to the United States of America. The public sector spends more than £14 billion a year on goods and services, so making that spend more circular could drive enormous environmental and social benefits. Given Scotland is just 1.3 per cent circular, it is worrying that the public procurement has not appropriately embedded circularity. So does the Minister agree that circular economy principles should be built into all appropriate contracts, both in terms of goods and services being bought, but also in terms of the scoring matrix for contract awards? And if so, how does he intend to progress this agenda? Minister. Thank, thank, thanks very much. And um, I, I know that the, the member um, takes this matter very seriously and it goes beyond the cheap politics at the start of his comments, so, so I will answer the question on, on, that, on that basis. So he, he's absolutely right about the importance of, of moving towards a more circular economy. Um, within um, procurement, um, our sustainable procurement tools contain cir circular economy e-learning, which um, helps public bodies to take account of climate and circular economy in their procurement activity. They also have guidance on materials and on waste, which are aimed at making best use of resources, including using circular economy principles. Um, um, we will promote the, the updated guidance on procuring for repair, reuse and remanufacturing from um, Zero Waste Scotland once that... Members, Sorry, let's, let's remember the requirement to treat one another with courtesy and respect and to hear one another. That. Minister. Yeah. So, so in, in, in principle, there are a number of tools which are in place. Clearly, we're not where we want to get to, and that's why we are working um, really hard to do that. I know that ministerial colleagues engage with Mr Golden regularly on this issue, so I know that, that this is um, an issue that is actually really important, and he actually wants to help us work together as a government and as a parliament to get this right. Thank you. Question number seven, Sue Webber. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports of a potential £200 million rise in non-domestic rates. 
Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Scottish Budget delivers the lowest poundage in the UK for the fifth year in a row, and the package of reliefs for 23-24 is estimated to be worth £749 million. Decisions on non-domestic rates for 2024-25 will be made in the context of the Scottish Budget, which will be published on the 19th of December. Sue Webber. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Given that business investment delays are a main contributor to Scotland's weak growth. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that reducing business rates would provide much needed relief to the sector? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, what I can say is that we have been working uh, with business. The New Deal for Business established a consultative subgroup to advise on the non-domestic rates system, which Tom Arthur it shares. Uh, that group has provided a really important opportunity for discussion on further enhancements uh, to the operation and administration of non-domestic rates uh, following the implementation of the Barclay Review. And we will look at those groups' recommendations and how we take them forward after they publish their plan on the 19th of October. I would just make this point that within, I think, what, 30 minutes of parliamentary business this afternoon, the Tories have asked for more money for local government and more money for business at a time where the UK government is likely to deliver a real terms cut to our resource and capital budget for 2024-25. Well, we know about our priorities, Mr. officer. We are very clear the about Cabinet our priorities. Secretary, Cabinet Secretary. Members will have different views on a whole range of issues. That does not mean that members need to join in from their seats when it's neither their opportunity to put a question or answer a question. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I think the panto season has started early for the Scottish Conservatives this afternoon, uh, Presiding Officer. The, the, the Conservatives, from a, a sedentary position as always, uh, were barking about priorities. This government is very clear on our priorities of tackling child poverty on net zero and delivering strong public services and a growing economy. What we hear from the Conservatives in this chamber is a scattergun approach of more money for everything with absolutely no credibility or propositions or ideas about how to fund it with a budget cut from Members. the Tory masters at Westminster. So what we need to see is some credibility from the Tory benches. I won't hold my breath though. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's welcome that the Scottish Government continues to deliver the lowest poundage in the UK. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update regarding how much this is expected to save ratepayers this year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I heard Tory groans about having the lowest poundage in the UK. So don't they want us to have the lowest poundage in the UK to support, for the fifth year in a row, to support business? Um, the freeze in the poundage for 23-24, which was business's biggest ask on non-domestic rates, is expected to save ratepayers £305 million this year compared with an inflationary increase. I know business welcomes that. It's just a pity others in this chamber can't bring themselves to welcome it. Question number eight, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what its priorities are for its 2024-25 budget. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are clear what our priorities are. The Scottish Government is committed to delivering on the priorities set out in the First Minister's policy prospectus and the programme for government in September. The three missions of equality, opportunity and community will guide us and I will lay out the tax and spending plans to Parliament on the 19th of December. This will be a budget of difficult choices as the economic conditions are set to remain challenging. We all know the reasons for that, with inflationary pressures continuing to impact on how households, businesses and public services. Neil Bibby. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Government announced it wanted to freeze the Council tax for the upcoming budget at SNP conference. We know that COSLA and the Scottish Greens were not consulted before then and the Government has failed today to give us any sort of figure about how much that policy would cost. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether or not civil servants were involved in helping to develop and formulate this proposal prior to its announcement? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, we were given uh, advice from civil servants in the normal matter, but I'm really beginning to get confused here about what Labour's position is on the council tax. One minute they're against it, then they're for it, and then they seem to be against it again. I think you need to perhaps read what your leader's comments were, who said that they would back it. This is a budget of difficult choices. 
and we have to balance the difficult choices of household finances and the cost of living crisis caused by the Conservative government with the need, of course, to invest in public services. So we'll bring forward our proposals that do that. What we need to see from Labour are any alternative costed credible policies and I will wait to see what those policies are because all of our policies on the 19th of December will be costed. I look forward to seeing Labour's alternatives to that. A brief supplementary, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, as we look beyond the upcoming budget, what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the challenges that Scotland's ageing population will pose to the funding of public services and would the Deputy First Minister comment on whether the challenge is being exacerbated by a hostile Westminster migration system which Scottish Labour also continue to back. Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Th thank you, President Officer. The, the, the Tories don't like to hear the truth because it is uncomfortable for them. But the challenges of an ageing population are considered when planning our budget. And it's clear, of, as, the, as Karen Adams said, that the UK government immigration policies are not meeting the needs of Scotland's communities, especially those in rural and island areas. We're unable to set our own immigration policies. We've given solutions like the rural visa pilot, uh, pilot proposal, yet the UK government's focus is on restricting migration and putting barriers in place for those who might seek to come here to build a new life. We, I think that is completely wrong-headed. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. Um, I'll allow a moment for front benches to organise before we move on.